that's a good spot right there. That's a good spot. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sunday mornings. Uh, if you have a gardening question, you can ask it down below, and I pull from those uh, each week uh, to uh, make this video. I have a playlist on my channel called Garden Question and Answer, and I've answered lots of questions uh, over the years if you want to go back and take a look at that playlist. Um, uh, one thing, I, I'll have a garden question and answer video next Sunday, and then I'm probably going to be skipping uh, a couple weeks uh, at that point just from some travel that I'll be doing. I don't know if I can consistently shoot the video. I will have some great favorite plant videos though coming up. I can't believe some of the people that I am actually uh, uh, interviewing here uh, in the next uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, the stars have aligned, and I have uh, uh, I have some rock stars of horticulture uh, to uh, uh, to find out what their favorite plants are. So those videos will be upcoming uh, during the uh, fall months. So I'm excited about that. Uh, I talked about I had a couple biopsies last week. Those came back clean, so I don't have to get my face cut on um, this time. Um, I have in the past, and uh, so I don't have to do it this time. So I'm um, happy about that. And again, you know, protect your skin when you're out here uh, in the sun, and especially um, uh, young folks, because I think that's where most of the damage comes. Um, is when we're when we're young and uh, and uh, indestructible, right? Okay. Uh, and again, uh, travel. I do have a lot of um, up, upcoming um, travel that I hope to get some interesting content from. So let's get started on questions that were asked on last week's video. Somebody asked me about pruning hollies in Zone Seven B right now, and I have talked about you know this is not a great time to be pruning things because you can encourage some new growth on them, which could be damaged. If you have old established hollies, though. Um, you're not going to hurt them by pruning them right now, even if they flush out a little bit and the, the, the winter stings them some. You're not going to hurt them. Uh, do keep in mind, that whatever cutting you do on something like that, um, that's how it's going to look through the winter. And so uh, you may just wait until late winter, early spring to do it just because, you know, you'll have to stare at them for six months, however you'd butcher them. <laughs> so, you know, keep that in mind. But I don't think you'll kill them. Uh, by pruning them now, old established hollies. I'm not talking about ones that are, you know, a few months old, but older ones, you'd have a hard time killing them really or, or hurting them seriously. But again, uh, they're also going to look bad through the winter if you, if you get after them hard. So you might want to wait just because of that reason. Um, <laughs> the next question is the, uh, and I don't want to pick on this person, but uh, their question uh, kind of... Um, if I had a formula on how to go about killing a plant, it would kind of been in this question. And it was, they planted a Rosa Sharon, it got some yellow leaves on it, they panicked, dug it up, added some garden soil, uh, some other soil to the mix and then, and replanted it. Uh, and it continues uh, to not look that great. When you get something, to, first of all, normally when you have some yellow interior leaves when you plant something, typically that's just, it's got a little dry. Uh, so that, that Rosa Sharon was probably in the process of blooming when it was planted and it can't do both. It can't bloom and support all those leaves and go through the stress of being planted. So it'll shed a few leaves. It was probably just overall no big deal. Um, but then if you start digging stuff up and, you know, mixing new soils into the, to your existing soil and, you know, especially those things labeled garden soil, um, uh, you can, you can create new problems. And so, uh, if, if you think a plant is really stressed in the space you put it in, I'm not saying don't move it or don't replant it, but I would probably pull it out of the ground, put it back in the container, nurse it back to health a little bit, and then put it back in the ground. Um, but that panic, digging it up, adding stuff, digging it up, adding stuff will compound problems. Uh, so just keep, just keep that in mind. If your plants are losing some interior leaves after you planted them, they have gotten dry at some point. Uh, it doesn't even mean they're dry that day. Um, you, you can see the damage is probably behind a little bit on the water. So if it got dry two weeks ago and now you're seeing the, uh, the, the, the damage from it now, you know, the interior leaves dropping off of it. But old interior leaves dropping off is typically it got dry. I don't always want to say that because then I don't want people to go out and just start panic watering. You know, uh, just go check it. If it needs water, water it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But plants will shed old interior leaves um, to 
continue to flower and to survive or just survive uh, some sort of transplanting or some sort of stress. It's just not that big of a deal. Um, don't panic about it. But if you do find a, plant, a space, sometimes you'll plant something and then you'll find out, oh my gosh, it's, it's shadier than I thought it was. It's sunnier than I thought it was. It's wetter than I thought it was. Wetter being the worst. Um, and you need to transplant it somewhere and it's gone through a little bit of stress, I might put that thing back in a container, kind of nurse it back to health a bit, and then select a new spot for it. Uh, because you'll be doubling down on stress if you went from one stressful spot to the next stressful spot, if that makes any sense. Okay, all right. Um, somebody, uh, oh, they have an area they want their perennials um, annuals to reseed, uh, but they want to have the area mulched as well. So yeah, if you mulch over the area after the seeds have already dropped off of those things, you will seal off um, those seeds just like you would any other weed seeds uh, that were there. Um, that would, uh, And you're not going to have a good annual or perennial seeded space coming back every year. I hope that makes sense. Um, so yeah, you, the only way you can really do that is probably just to uh, mulch the area with a little bit of compost uh, in, in the fall so you're barely covering any of it. For me, I would rather collect the seeds from the perennials or the annuals, save them, cover that area for the winter with compost, um, a little bit thicker of a layer, and then come back in April uh, or early May, Holly, um, and uh, and just throw those seeds out on top of it and, and, or, and then stir them in maybe a little bit with a garden rake. Um, that's the process. I did that video with Bree Arthur, how, how she does her annuals uh, earlier this year, if you want to go back and take a look at that. But she's saving the seed through the winter uh, and not relying on it falling in place and coming back up. Um, it's definitely possible, but I think you're going to end up with a lot of weeds uh, in that space if the ground's not thoroughly covered. So you're right to want to cover it but you will seal off those weed seeds same you know the thought you were having is accurate uh so again if, if you can learn how to save the seeds uh through the winter i think that's a better approach and then get that ground covered through the winter uh and that will improve that soil so maybe your annuals are better year to year that's the better way to do it um i get a lot of question about questions about army worms and i just don't know enough about them i'm not ignoring your questions i just don't know I haven't had a lot of experience uh, with army worms. Those of you who have know that the, how destructive they can be in turf uh, and other things. Um, row crops like corn. Keep in mind, corn is a grass, um, you know, and uh, uh, ar army worms go after. Um, they go after a lot of different things, but primarily grasses. And uh, I just don't know that much about them. Those fall army worms. I know they overwinter, you know, in South Florida, and then they work their way back up. Uh, every year and then there's those true army worms that are like early uh, early season army worms i just don't know that much about them i have hope um uh, i do take a lot of continued education classes because i keep my landscape contractor's license and if i see one on uh insects or some um, or, or that includes army worms um, i will i do want to go and learn uh, more about their cycle and their destructive habits i know people try to use BT as an organic um, when the larvae are small, but I don't know, again, I don't know the timing on those things. So I'm not ignoring the questions. I just don't want to act like an expert on something that I'm not an expert on. Uh, uh, somebody asked me about a crepe myrtle that gets three feet or less. There are a lot of dwarf crepe myrtles. I still like Pocomoke. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's a National Arboretum introduction. It'll creep up to about four feet in 15 years uh, so it'd be e super super easy to keep it uh three feet or less the national arboretum ones uh that have indian names for some reason i don't know i don't i've never actually understood this because um uh, i believe crepe myrtles are from india but somehow they have american indian names like tuscarora and natchez and uh pokemoke and so on and so forth but anyway i, I don't know why that naming thing happened but Pokemoke is a little dwarf round one that the National Arboretum did. Again, there's a ton of new dwarf ones, but I do know that the National Arboretum ones are super, are super disease resistant. And that one grows as a little round ball. Uh, there's some on campus over here on NC State that are probably 20 years old and they're no more than maybe four, four and a half feet tall, but that's after 20 years. They could have easily been kept much, much smaller. Holly, come here, come here, get out of there. Get out of there. She, I knew she'd been back here, hadn't she? 
these people are telling on you every week, Chloe. Um, somebody had some herbicide damage on a Rosa Sharon, and um, it's coming back from the ground. Uh, so, so it killed back to the ground. It's coming back from the ground with a little bit of variegated uh, foliage, and they asked me if that's a thing. There are variegated um, uh, uh, there are variegated Rosa Sharon, so yes, there are variegations. I don't know whether your variegated Rosa Sharon will be stable. That's always the question. So you have to take cuttings on them. Um, I would wait till next year, and then you can take cuttings on them in like June. Uh, and then you'd have to grow them out for a couple seasons. These things go through a long, you know, several years uh, and several rounds of cuttings on them to find out if the variegation is stable. I, there are there are tons of plants where you have a beautiful variegation and then it just turns out it's not stable or, or reverts back to green all the time or whatever. So it, it's a, it's a who knows whether you got a thing or not. Um, let's see, somebody's got some dead branches in their abelia and wanted to know if they could um, prune those out. Dead branches you can take out of things anytime uh, you want to take them out. I, I don't, I don't, there's no real rule for uh, when, when to cut out dead stuff. Um, so if you've got branches that are completely dead on something, um, go ahead and, uh, you know, and get, and get them out of there uh, w whenever you want to. If you want to wait till late winter to do it when you're pruning other, you know, everything, then that's fine. But again, uh, uh, dead branches, I, I, I'll get out the sooner, the better, just, you know, if nothing else, it gets air movement, um, into your plants and that kind of thing so that they can fill back in to those spaces. Okay, somebody asked me, do I always cut back plants when I'm transplanting? So if I'm digging something out of the ground and moving it, yes, typically I'm going to do some reduction in the size of that plant in the process of moving it, unless I thought the stars were just aligning perfectly, meaning I was going to have two weeks where it was 70 degree temperatures, a couple chances of rain, um, you know, maybe um, nighttime temperatures that weren't cold, uh, daytime temperatures that weren't hot. Uh, that kind of thing, then, then I might go for it uh, without uh, without doing any reduction in size. So, I'm I'm going to look at the forecast to determine that. But if I'm moving it and it's 90 degrees out the, for the next week, I'm definitely reducing the size on it. Uh, if it's like 20s for the next week, I might just skip that altogether and wait for it to be slightly milder uh, before I did it. But again, I'm I'm determining that if I'm reducing them based on whether the stars align and I just have perfect weather out in front of me. But for the most part, yeah, cut them back. Okay, uh, somebody's having a hard time finding a flamethrower red bud, which I've talked about several times. I think next season you're gonna see lots more. Uh, I'm going over to uh, Jackson Nursery in Tennessee sometime this fall. And um, if I don't get there this fall, I'll definitely get there next spring. But I know they have a lot of material over there. They, they supply the other nurseries um, with the uh, with the stock on a lot of those and uh, several nurseries that do but jackson grows a lot of red butts and uh, uh i think the numbers are you know creeping up it just takes a few years for a new plant when everybody wants them uh, especially something that's grafted like this it just takes a long time to build up build up numbers but i think this next spring we'll see lots of them uh, somebody's got a rose creek abelia that's floppy in a container and that's just true with all dwarf abelias uh, they are just floppy is all get out in a container you got to be super careful transplanting them uh, lower petalum can be this way too uh, make sure when you when you take a dwarf abelia like rose creek miss lemon radiance i don't care what it is dwarf abelias when you take them out of the container make sure you support the soil don't ever pull on the top of a, the plant because they're easy to break it's just kind of normal with an abelia that they have kind of small wood where it enters um right where it enters the soil. They get tougher in time, uh, but heck, when you're growing them in the nursery, a lot of times they'll flop over this way, and then you'll do a little pruning on them, and then they'll fill back in this way, and then they'll flop over that way. And that's almost just kind of what we expect on those little dwarf abelia. But they can be, they can be fragile, so be careful with them when you're getting them to the ground. They're tough as nails plants in the landscape, but they are kind of fragile right at the spot where they enter the soil, and they can be floppy in the pot. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, somebody asked me if they moved an azalea now, would they still bloom in the spring? Again, that goes back to that question about whether you're moving something and cutting it back. If you're moving it and cutting it back, no, you're going to lose the spring flowers. If you're moving it and not cutting it back, you get the spring flowers. If the plant, if 
survives your transplanting. So you're best to dig it up, cut it back a little, and uh, move it and sacrifice the flowers for the first for the first spring. You may still get a few flowers because unless you're because there are some interior buds on them too. So I don't think you'll cut all flowers off, but you will reduce the number of flowers. Uh, but it's not as drastic as you'll get zero flowers. Um, okay, what else we got? Um, somebody asked me if I'm doing propagation videos. I actually, believe it or not, went to the old house this past week, and I've got azaleas from my grandfather's uh, azalea that I took cuttings on and from that uh, dwarf uh, purple crepe myrtle that I have next to my uh, ne had next to my porch there. And they're on this uh, back porch and I haven't gotten my propagation um, set up over here. Yes, I plan on having some propagation videos and I'm going to have to heat this space because I'm so late doing it. But I actually have some interesting things I've gone and taken cuttings on. I'm not filming at the house. Um, uh, it'd be very unfair. Um, it's, a little, it's, not in the, it's not in perfect shape. Um, it was asking a lot of a young couple with a young child to come in and maintain that kind of landscape. So we're not showing it. But the plants are all alive there, and I can go back and get cuttings, and they're a really nice, really nice young couple that bought my old house. Okay, um, weird. His brother sent me an email asking me what type of figs were in that landscape because his kids come over and eat the figs, and that got the process rolling of me being able to go back to the old house and get cuttings. Um, so those cuttings are available to me, and they'll be part of my propagation series. Okay, uh, that goes to another question here. Um, somebody asked me about... Um, their figs losing leaves. Fruit looks fine, they're fruiting right now, all of that. That goes, same thing about it, losing leaves to, plants will sacrifice leaves to, um, to fruit. And so likely uh, here in the late summer, uh, we had a bit of a dry stretch, dry stretch here, I don't know where you are, but we had a bit of a dry stretch and um, likely it's just defoliating some to uh, compensate, um, to continue to fruit. I mean, it's, it's you know, it wants to reproduce itself. Uh, and it will do that at the expense of leaves and, you know, its own personal health. So uh, I think that's what it is. Um, and I probably wouldn't worry about it. It's going to go dormant soon anyway. Uh, somebody asked me about Rose Rosette um, uh, and what it looks like. And uh, here's a photo of it. And I included it on a uh, video that I put up uh, a couple days ago about a uh, um, uh, three that I had to pull out on a landscape job, a one day landscape job video so here's that photo and it just is a witch's broom um, on the end of it and it's an aerified mite that spreads this um, disease and it at least in the raleigh area uh, has just gone absolutely wild i see very few knockout roses right now that don't um, show signs of this of this broom um, growth and uh, it seems like the first year i'll see a little bit on it and then the second year um, it just goes rampant, and if they don't get them out quick, they just die in the third year, uh, is what it appears. A lot of people trying to cut them out, cut the cut the witch's broom out, like they're going to come back. They will not work. Dig them up, bag them up, get them off your property. Hopefully, hopefully, we create some breaks between these roses, and some of them will uh, uh, will be okay. I know a lot of people love their knockout roses, but this is another example of. Uh, we as humans find something that we really, really like and attach ourselves to. And then because the neighbors got them, we have to have them. We can't enjoy theirs. We've got to have them too. And we've just connected the dots on these roses everywhere. Uh, we did it with um, uh, uh, red tip fetinias and then they you know, went away. We've done it with Leyland cypress. We've seen it with, you know, lots of different, uh, lots of different plants coming, almost come and go. Uh, when something gets that crazy popular and it's everywhere, a disease or insect finds it and you know and uh and wipes them out but that's what's happening here in raleigh i don't know um in other areas you know i'm assuming it's in i've seen it in greensboro too i was at the i actually sold it to greensboro farmers market years ago i saw it there 10 years ago uh and they took their roses out about 10 years ago um so so fairly early on maybe not 10 let's say eight uh the fairgrounds over here the north Carolina fairgrounds took theirs out pretty early on i got a crow over here making lots of noise okay last question for this week uh, somebody has this is another abelia question it was uh, uh they have a abelia most abelias are hardy in zone six to nine in zone six they get thin in the winter time so they're kind of semi evergreen we would call it and in nine they tend to be more evergreen and they're in 7a wanted to know whether they'd be evergreen 
they'll be evergreen for you, but they may thin some winters more than others. So it'll be, it'll be temperature dependent. There may be winters where they're very full and evergreen and other winters where they're slightly thin. And that was true even here in 7B, uh, pretty normal on Abelia that they will thin based on those, the winter that you're having. So uh, most years, I'll answer one more real quick. Somebody asked me about burning bush pruning when they could prune their burning bush. If it's an established burning bush, you can probably, um, you know, cut it to the ground, park your car on it and, um, you know, cover it in plastic and build a house on it and it'll still come up through the floorboards. <laughs> That's unfortunately uh, kind, of, kind of the truth. You can prune your bu burning bush anytime you want to prune your burning bush. Um, again, uh, non plants that were growing um, that we don't care about flowering are probably best done in the late winter if you need to prune it hard, but you're not going to hurt a burning bush um, pruning it whenever you want to prune it. If it's an old established one, um, they'll come back right from the ground, uh, really, and probably 800 seedlings around them as well. Uh, so thank you guys for following along with my uh, question and answer videos. Ask questions down below. Again, I'll be I'll have one next Sunday, and then I'm probably going to skip a couple weeks just because I'm um, uh, going to be uh, doing some other things on the road. So thanks again.